Good afternoon. Welcome to Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church on October 29th, 2023. Today is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. And um, there is a leaflet among the leaflets that you collected when you came in with some announcements, and I'll just point out a few. Uh, the first one that I will point out is that um, also included is a connect card, and this is a great way to get in touch with Father John. So if you would like to fill that out, you could put it in the offering plate when it comes by or give it to uh, Father John or Miss Louise. Also, there is a, a new group that has started up, the Lectio Divina group, which is held at my home every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. It's a guided meditation on the daily office reading for that evening. And so um, you're welcome to read about that and come if you would like. And also, um, Cascadia Women's, Uge Women's Union is looking for a parish liaison, and so they are looking for somebody from our congregation to volunteer to be that point of contact. So if you're interested in that, um, go ahead and let Father John know about that. Women yes. <laughs> yes. Um, also, um, out in the foyer, there are free gifts for visitors. So um, don't forget that you can pick up your gift in a blue cinch, cinch sack if you are, if this is your first time visiting. There are also um, bookmarks out there for the diocesan women's retreat that's going to be held in April, April 19 through 21 at the CBET Conference Center. There is a cost involved, but um, I would encourage you to check that out and see women again if you would like to attend. All right, thank you very much. Our processional hymn is hymn number 
Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy upon us, upon us. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy upon us, upon us. A reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 44, verses 1 through 14. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers in their generations. The Lord apportioned to them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. There were those who ruled in their kingdoms and were men renowned for their power, giving counsel by their understanding and proclaiming prophecies, leaders of the people in their deliberations and in understanding of the people's learning wise in their words of instruction, those who composed musical tunes and set forth verses in writing, rich men furnished with resources, living peaceably in their dwelling places. All these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. There are some of them who have left a name so that their praises are declared. And there are some who have no memorial, who perished as though they had not lived. They have become as though they had not been born and so have their children after them. But these were, nevertheless, men of mercy, whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. With their descendants it will remain, a goodly inheritance to their posterity. Their descendants stand by the covenants, their children also, for their sake. Their posterity will continue forever, and their glory will not be blotted out. Their bodies were buried in peace, and their name lives to all generations. Peoples will declare their wisdom, and the congregation proclaims their praise. Here ends the reading.
Let us read Psalm 149 responsively after the asterisk. Do we stand? We do. Sorry. Praise the Lord. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Let the congregation of the faithful praise him. Let Israel rejoice in the one who made him. And let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord has pleasure in his people and gives victory to those who are oppressed. Let the faithful be joyful with glory. Let them rejoice upon their beds. Let the praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and to rebuke the peoples, to bind their kings in chains and their nobles with links of iron, that they may execute judgment upon them as it is written. Such honor have all his faithful. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Today we're celebrating the Feast of All Saints. Please be seated. <laughs> oh, you have to stand for this one. <laughs> It's extra long, too. <laughs> so, yeah, we are celebrating the Feast of All Saints. That's actually on this Wednesday, November 1st. We are commemorating those who became before us in the faith. You know, think about Abraham and Sarah, Joseph the Patriarch, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, David, Elijah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Esther, Nehemiah, Jacob, Maccabees, Maccabeus, Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, Joachim and Anna, the Virgin Mary, the mother of our God, Mary Magdalene, Peter and Paul, Aidan, Cranmer, Teresa of Nisu, <clears throat> Teresa of Calcutta. You might ask, what is a saint? Saints are those who live transparent life before God and men, like windows, sometimes clear, sometimes cloudy. But they live in our lives through whom the light of God's grace can shine brightly. And, and you know, that's what the halo means around the head of when you see uh, like icons of saints. You know, the halo represents holiness, the holiness and grace of the Holy Spirit shining through their life. It's not their merits that make them holy. It's the merits of Christ. The merits of Christ won for them and for us on the cross. That's what makes them and us holy. They made themselves available to God, and God did in them mighty acts to accomplish his covenantal purposes for his people. By virtue of our baptism, we who have given our allegiance to Jesus Christ as Lord are saints. Yet we must live lives worthy of our calling and grace. When we mess up and sin, when we sin against God and our neighbor, we only have to confess our sins. Ideally, sometimes, through the sacrament of confession. Why? So as not to deceive ourselves of the magnitude and burden of our sins. Yet, when we confess our sins, Christ freely and completely forgives us all our sins and lifts that terrible burden off our shoulders and off our souls. Christ freely forgives us. This points to the fact that until we rest in the presence of grace, in the presence of Christ with his saints who have gone before us, or until his glorious coming again, we must strive and grow. That's why St. Paul in Romans 1.7 or 1 Corinthians 1.2 says we are called to be saints. Sainthood, or if you like, sanctification. Becoming like Christ. That's a journey in this life. With all its ups and downs. All its failures and victories. You know, in the simplest sense, you could say, saint is someone who, having been saved by God's unmerited kindness, walks in the way of Jesus. This brings us to our gospel reading for today. In Matthew 5, 1 through 12, Jesus begins to tell us what that way of life looks like. He tells us that the world, what the world looks like when God is king over all the earth. Because the world, and often we ourselves, collude with the enemy of our souls. And so there will naturally be conflict when the kingdom of God collides with the kingdom, the parody kingdom of the devil. So it's not like, the, like God is king and therefore everything is peachy king. Well, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Nevertheless, God is king, and he inaugurated his kingdom in the person of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Yes, through the crucifixion, death, 
burial, resurrection, and his ascension to the right hand of God, but also in his earthly ministry. Every time Jesus healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, raised the dead, or cast out demons, he was establishing his rule and showing to the people precisely what it looks like when God is king. Make no mistake, even with all the evil we see in the world, the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling the world at the right-hand side of God as Lord over all the earth. With the resurrection of Jesus, God has brought his bright and glorious future into uh, the future of the age to come. Yes. Into the middle of history. He's taken that future age and brought it here in our presence through the resurrection. And also, the church as Christ's body if she's doing what she's been called to do, is a, also a signpost to that future age. Every time we feed the poor, house the homeless, clothe the naked, make peace with those around us, or just smile and offer a hand of friendship, we are working out what it means to live in the age to come. Right here and now, we are a resurrection people. Yet there is still the matter that this present age is fallen. Both the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness exist, <coughs> exist side by side. Therefore, again, there is bound to be conflict. There is just something about Jesus that the dark powers and the tyrants of the world don't like. Perhaps it's because he disarmed the principalities and powers and paraded them out in the open in shame. <coughs> Perhaps it's because Jesus completely turned upside down all of what the world considers success and power. This brings us to the first part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, with his list of those who are blessed. The worst mistake we can make about this famous and stunning passage is to see it as a list of rules. You've got to try hard to be born in the Spirit. You've got to be hard. You've got to try hard to mourn and to be meek and so on. That's not the point. The, these words are, in fact, a royal announcement that God is turning the world upside down. You can almost, almost hear the hopes and fears of the Jewish people. The people of Jesus' days who taught them. They might have said, we've been looking for this moment. But we didn't know what it was going to be like. For generations, we've all been taught that one day our God, the maker of heaven and earth, would come back to us and set everything right. But as time has gone on, it has looked like more and more that he's forgotten all about us. <sighs> Arrogant foreign soldiers have pushed their way into our land. Other nations with their strange and lurid cultures have taken over some of our towns and changed them into places where decent people wouldn't go. And the taxes they made us pay. Anyone would think that we were still slaves instead of God's free. Nobody quite knew what it would like when God came back to them. Some people may have thought it would be like that a great pillar of fire and cloud, a cloud of a pillar of cloud and fire in the days of the people's rescue and exodus from Egypt. Some thought he would come riding on a horse. Of, at the head of a great army to crush and defeat the horrible people who are making us so miserable. Some, like the zealots, said that they, they better not wait any longer. Perhaps God wanted them to act first through re revolt and murderous brigandry. And then he'll come and help us. We just have to get it all started. So when the people heard about this prophet who was going around the villages and healing people and saying the sovereign rule of God of heaven was now on the way, they were really excited. What was his plan? What did he say was going to happen? Well, Jesus said that God was indeed on the move and that the down and out were going to come out on top. They had their spirits crushed. They had been sorrowful. They had all been longing for God's way to try, triumph. It had been a hunger eating away from them on the inside. 
And now Jesus was saying that the poor in spirit will inherit heaven's kingdom. That the sorrowful will be comforted. That the hungry will be satisfied. Yes, all right, finally. This is what they've been waiting for. But how will that happen? What are his plans for making it happen? What do we do? What do the people have to do? Do we need to be stricter in our Torah observance for the Messiah to come? That's what the Pharisees preached everywhere. Will they need to take up arms in revolution against Rome like the Celtics urge? Well, this prophet, Jesus, was saying other things too. He was saying that it's the meek who will inherit the earth, not the rich, the powerful, or the violent. And some of the crowd liked those zealots. Well, they didn't like that. That sounded like a cop-out. And he was saying that the merciful and the peacemakers are the ones who will receive God's mercy and who will be called God's children. And of course, they thought, well, all of the children of Israel are God's children simply by being descendants of Abraham. Yet it sounded as though Jesus was reshaping Israel itself. And that really didn't please those who wanted to go out and fight and kill to make God's kingdom come. Others believed that when God rescued his people, like he did when they were slaves in Egypt, that he would summarily defeat the pagan Roman overlords. And all they would have to do is sit back and watch the spectacle. Again, like in the days when God drowned the army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea. But this prophet, this Jesus, was saying that it was going to be tough. People were going to hate and persecute them. Well, what's new with that? God's people had plenty of hate and persecution already. It sounded as though Jesus was saying that God was about, a new, about to do a new thing. And like the ancient prophets, many of the people, well, they weren't going to like it. He was calling people to repent and to follow him, even though it was going to be unpopular. Is this what Jesus thought it would look like when God finally returned to Zion? When God's people would be victoriously on top? Some of the crowd may not have known where these sayings of Jesus were leading. But they hadn't heard anyone speaking like this before. It sounded like a whole new way of being God's people. It was a whole new way of being human. Well, they tried everything else. Maybe, just maybe, this was, after all, what it was going to look like when God returned to finally rescue his people. This Jesus was teaching with an authority that the people was not, were not accustomed to. It was like he really knew God, personally, like a son. What's more... He was not only speaking their language, you know, using stories that reflected their daily lives and their concerns, but he was also speaking with vigor and a breath of fresh air. He did say, after all, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. This breath contained and conveyed new life in every word. And some of that crowd were ready to sign up. What about you? People often say, what wonderful teaching the Sermon on the Mount is. And that if only people would obey it, the world would be a better place. But if we think of Jesus simply sitting there telling people how to behave properly, we miss the point of what's really going on. These blessings, makarios in the Greek, also translated to be hilariously happy. Hilariously happy are the poor in spirit. What? Yeah, these blessings, yeah, through them he was announcing. He was not saying, try to live like this. But he was announcing and saying to the people who are already like this, the down and out, they're the ones who are in good shape. They would be happy, they should be happy and celebrate. The gospel is precisely for them. Another way of translating Makarios is wonderful news. Part of the point is that 
this God has wonderful news. God is acting in and through Jesus to turn the world upside down, to turn Israel's world upside down, and to pour out lavish blessings on all who now turn to him and accept this, his new way of doing things. Even if it's not what we or the people back then anticipated. You know, this list of characteristics, by the way, is often called the Beatitudes. Because the Latin word, Beatus, making sure the Latin expert that. Well, it, Beatus means blessed. So, Beatitude. But the point is not to offer a list of what sorts of people God normally blesses. The point is to announce God's new covenant. In Deuteronomy, the people, and this is, a, oh, this is so cool, right? In Deuteronomy, the people came out of Egypt through the water of the Red Sea and into the wilderness and arrived at the border of the Promised Land. Later, led by Joshua, Yeshua in Hebrew, Jesus in Greek. Later, Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land through the Jordan River. But before entering the Promised Land, though, God gave them a solemn covenant at Mount Sinai. He listed the blessings and the curses that would come upon them if they were obedient or disobedient. Deuteronomy 28. Now Matthew, in the first chapters of his Gospel, shows us Jesus coming up out of Egypt through the water of the Jordan River into the wilderness, and then into the promised land. Just as his people did in their exodus long ago. Now Jesus was at the top of a mountain, like Moses at Mount Sinai, instructing the people about a new covenant. Here now is the new exodus in Jesus. Not from Pharaoh, but the exodus from sin and death itself. Here now is his new covenant. So Jesus is not suggesting that these beatitudes are simply timeless truths about the way the world is or about human behavior. If he was saying that, then he was wrong. Mourners often go uncomforted. The meek don't inherit the earth. Those who long for justice frequently take that longing to the grave. Yet, as I said, Jesus was preaching an upside-down world, or perhaps a right way up. And he was saying that with his work in ministry, it was starting to come true. These nine Beatitudes are an announcement, not a philosophical analysis of the world. It is about something that was starting to happen. In his preaching, in his miracles of healing, in every exorcism, which was a, uh, which was a confrontation with the dark forces and his authority over them. All those things, he was announcing the royal proclamation that God had finally returned to his people in his very own person, and that his life and actions were what it looked like when God became king. It is the gospel, good news, not good advice. Therefore, there are only two responses possible. Reject Jesus' proclamation either actively or by doing nothing, or return, repent from how you do things and how you think things ought to be and do things Jesus' way. Jesus said to his first disciples, follow me. He said this because in him and in him alone, the living God was doing a new thing. And this list of beatitudes was a part of his invitation, part of his summons, a part of way of part, a, a way of saying that God was at work in a new way, and that this is what it looks like. That is why the psalmist says in Psalm 98, 1 through 3, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. 
Indeed, Jesus was beginning a new era for God's people and for God's world. This is not only what it looks like when God becomes king, but it also is what it looks like when God, in the Messiah, in Abraham's descendant, it's what it looks like when he fulfills his, his promise to Abraham, his faithful friend. And what was that promise? The promise was that through Abraham, God would create a great nation, a holy people to be the light to the nations, that God would recreate humanity, and form one new great family by blessing the whole world through his descendant. Yes, Jesus was that descendant. That is why Jesus had to be Jewish. He had to be born of a Jewish mother. The son of God was also at the same time the son of Abraham, the son of David. Salvation is truly from the Jews. From here on, all the ways that the people thought they knew, all the things that they thought they had to do to ready themselves for the Messiah, the Messiah's coming, all that was going to work the other way around. So when did these promises become true? You know, there's a great temptation for Christians to answer, well, in heaven after death. At first sight, verses 3, 10, 11, seem to say this. The kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit and the persecuted. And there's a great reward in heaven for those who suffer persecution for Jesus' sake. This, though, is, is a misunderstanding of the meaning of heaven. Heaven is God's space. It's where God dwells. It's where full reality exists. And it is close by our ordinary earthly space. And it, it interlocks with it. Like the incarnation of Jesus himself, one day heaven and earth will be joined together forever. And the true state of affairs, which is at present out of sight, will be revealed. As if a curtain has been opened and we see what's in the back. And if heaven is where God is, and God is omnipresent, that is, if God is everywhere, then heaven is all around us. That is why we can com confidently confess in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the communion of saints and why the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, 1 says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. He was referring to all the saints that he commemorated in chapter 11 of this is a great and glorious truth that we would do well to remember as we celebrate the feast day of all saints. Knowing that those who came before us are with us in some mysterious, real way, yet real way, praying for us, cheering us on, we can be encouraged also to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The meaning to all this, in fact, comes in the next chapter in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. It is the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. It is the prayer that we pray every week. We are to pray that God's kingdom will come, God's will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. The life of heaven, the life of the realm where God is already king, is to become a the life of the world, transforming the present earth, transforming it into a place of beauty and delight that God had always intended. That is why it's the Holy Spirit presently intercedes for us in groanings that are too deep for words as we lament, lament the present condition of the world, stuck in its futility and pain. We wait and we look for the resurrection of the dead, when God will renew us and the whole world. The resurrection of the body and the renewal of the earth points to one thing. God has not and will not give up on his creation and covenant project. That is what God's faithfulness to us and to creation means. And Jesus is the means and the guarantor of God's faithfulness. 
Just as in the person of Jesus Christ, heaven and earth, spirit and matter, God and man are joined inseparably and eternally, and thereby sanctifying, glorifying the whole world. Then and there, all these promises will be fulfilled. Then and there, the words of St. John in Revelation 21 will be evident to all. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth and the first heaven, heaven had passed away. And the sea was no more. Look, you guys don't like sailing and surfing. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And those who follow Jesus now are to begin by this, to live by this rule here and now, contributing their gifts and talents for the betterment of the world in anticipation for the world to come. That's the point of the Sermon on the Mount and his Beatitudes in particular. They are a summons to live in the present moment in a way that will make sense in God's future because that future has arrived in the present in Jesus of Nazareth. It may seem upside down, but we are called to believe with great daring that it is in fact the right way up. I'll conclude with this. You know, sadly in our world, still, most people think that the blessedness that Jesus spoke about consists of success and wealth and long life and victory in battle. And if that doesn't match up with your life, if you find yourself down and out, if you've made mistakes in life leading to failures, if worldly wealth and success are not even on your radar, if you, have, if you can count more tears on your pillow than you care to, if you are insulted for your faith in either blatant or more likely those snide, subtle ways, Jesus is offering wonderful news to you. He is saying that the humble, the poor, the mourners, and peacemakers are blessed and to be hilariously happy. But too often we are precisely the ones who insult. We are the ones who, instead of fervently praying with tears and lamentation for the world and for lost souls, we barely speak a word to God, except when we find ourselves in a bind. We are the ones who fight, insisting on our rights, which usually translates merely into insisting on our own comforts. We are the ones who neglect repentance and confession of sins, let alone being pure in heart. We are the ones, we are the ones who seek to one up and, and outdo others, let alone have mercy on them. We daily miss the mark of God's glory to be the kind of people he created and recreated us to be. We fail to reflect God's image in the world, to engage the world with our gifts and talents, to change the world for the better, in anticipation for the future. Instead, we hide our light under a basket. We add to the misery and bitterness that the world trades in every day. We praise God with our lips, but not in our lives. And to think that this is not true of us is to demonstrate just how far gone we are from the world. But even in this, we can rejoice because it's precisely for sinful people like us that Jesus came to die. It is to us who confess that we are far off from the Lord that the Lord draws near. The Lord knows who you are, yet he still loves you. It is his unsurpassable grace and mercy that convicts us of sin and repentance. Why would we want to try to cover up our sins so as to deceive ourselves and to miss out on true life when he stands ready to forgive all of us and all our sins by just asking? Forgiveness costs us nothing, but it costs Jesus everything. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
Don't neglect such a great and complete salvation just so you can pretend to be okay. Jesus, the friend of sinners, freely and tangibly offers us to himself the benefits of his dreadful yet beautiful sacrifice on the cross. He offers of himself here in the supper of his precious body and blood. Blessed indeed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed indeed are the mournful, the meek, the merciful. Blessed too are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come to Jesus. He's waiting with open arms. Won't you come? Lord Jesus, help us to hear your voice, to accept your challenge, and to follow you in the way of your kingdom. Now let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he arose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Kevin, our Bishop, for Jacob, our Bishop-elect, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, for St. Barnabas Anglican Church and Yangon, Myanmar, and Lord of Mercy Anglican Church in, in Oregon. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority and for all in public service, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Anderson and Barbara, Brenda, Christine, Gareth, and Jenny, <coughs> Jay, Katie, and Kelly. Kelly, Father Mac, Nevin, and Pam. Paul and Richard, Rose, Terry, Theodore, a family in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially Gloria, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There are any other petitions?
you'd like to make to the Lord, you can do that now. Any, any good news? What has the Lord done for you this past week? That's welcome. We get encouraged by hearing those. You notice I prayed for Gloria. She was a parishioner at the church I was at in Southern California. She had been battling illness for quite a long time. She was an older lady, probably in her 90s, 96. She passed away in this past week. Uh, at the end of the month, we pray for birthdays and anniversaries. Clearly, the better half of the uh, marriage is here. <laughs> so it's it's uh this month was uh, Jenny and Jerry's uh, anniversary. Thirty three years. Wow. Congratulations. Oh God, you have consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send your blessings upon your servants, Jenny and Jerry. As they begin another year, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congratulations. And uh, for birthdays, well, um, there's two this month, but I'm just going to pray up here. One of them is my oldest son, Braden, but I can't help but to pray for him. So if you're wondering who Braden is, you know, that's who it is. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant, Braden, and others who had a birthday this month. As they begin another year, grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There are no other prayers, and we'll continue. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we and may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what the word of God says to all who turn to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit.
Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is 
right. Our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For in the multitude of your saints, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses that we, rejoicing in their fellowship, may run with patience the race that is set before us, and together with them may receive the unfading crown of glory. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Jesus Christ into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts, sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bringeth with, bring us with all your saints, among them your martyrs James Hannington and his companions, priest and teacher James Hooker, and all your faithful departed into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask of your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him, and with Him, and in Him, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Hallelujah.